Hello there people, it's uh, Zach here again today. And uh, as mentioned in my last video, today I'm going to be talking about the afterlife and the inner reality and I'm going to be providing a, a sort of proof um, for the existence of an afterlife. Um, so first we're going to recap on some of the older ideas because they're necessary for understanding this. And um, and I just want to I don't want to make it to where you have to go back and watch all my previous videos to um, get a general idea of why this is the case. Um, now, if you're trying to figure out definitively what's true and what's real in the universe, the only thing that you absolutely know for certain that can't I mean beyond a shadow of a doubt is your own existence. Um, you think, therefore you are. Um, anything else beyond this comes to you through the filter of your senses. Um, and your senses lie to you. You you see things that aren't there. You hear things that aren't there. You feel things that didn't happen. I'm like vibrating phone in a pocket. Um, and, and there's another problem um, when you're talking about the existence of form and being in the in the outer reality, which is that there is form and being in the inner reality as well. We see things in our dreams. We hear things in our dreams. We hear, we feel things in our dreams. Um, and and so we're presented with this problem that we have to figure out what the difference is between the inner and the outer world. And um, the conclusion that I reached with this was that the outer world has something called a nature, um, which is an order and persistence to things. Um, take for example, I mean, like if you if you grab a ball and you lift the ball and you let go, one hundred times out of one hundred in the outer reality, that ball will fall straight to the ground. And uh, we call this persistent pattern gravity. Um, now. It's important to mention that when it comes to persistent patterns, we cannot label these things as laws in, in reality because um, you can't prove that the time that you didn't do something that it would that um, it works exactly the same. You can't prove what didn't happen. You can only prove um, the existence of observations and uh, thus the existence of patterns. And um, one of the uh, the basis of the scientific method was this idea of empiricism, which is that um, it has nothing to do with consensus or uh, to do with authority. Um, it has to do with this idea that we can create um, we, we can create these experiments and make hypotheses and then perform the experiments, um, note our observations and reach particular conclusions and then our compare our conclusions with the conclusions of others and to say that yes, um, this phenomena does actually exist and yes, it does seem to happen in the, in the case uh, in the way that we see it. And uh, so this is, um, but this idea of empiricism also extends to this idea of the inner reality as well, because um, th there's a there's a note, and a lot of people who are scientifically minded who will say, um, well, the, the the things that you're 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 saying, they're all just in your head, they're, they're, they're so they're not real. Well, yes, they're in your head, but that doesn't mean that they're not real. I mean, the basis of empiricism is that you're supposed to be able to um, experience things for yourself. So if you are experiencing for that, it's in it's in your head. You see it, you see it. If you hear it, you hear it. Um, you can't deny the existence of something just because it's in your head. And and as a matter of fact, um, going uh, building off of my last video um, about how the, the inner mind um, affects the outer reality, um, the... Uh, the way that we perceive the world and the way that we interpret uh, the information that comes to us and also the way that we react to things and our expectations that cause us to manifest particular behaviors is all ba based on our internal mind. So although the external world does affect our internal world, our internal world also um, affects the outer world um, as manifest through our behaviors. And um, even beyond that, the... Uh, if you really start thinking about um, the identities of, of form and being, like how, how you distinguish between two different forms or two different beings, um, you eventually reach a, a conclusion that there's actually, it's rather arbitrary. Um, like there, there's no definitive distance of separation at which two forms become separate and distinct. Um, and in the case of being, because being is a nothing in space, is infinite and uh, continuous in space, which means that all being intersects in space. And if all being intersects in space, then there's fundamentally only one being. So what you have is this idea that even though we can distinguish between the being of one thing, like the ele electric field of a particle, or, or we can distinguish uh, one form independently from another um, by decomposing these things, especially um, you know through like pattern recognition and whatever, but um, 
there's an inverse aspect to this that everything is is a cohesive whole. So if um if the self is influencing the world and the world is influencing the self and the world itself is connected, um, even to these two degrees of separation, we find that there is in fact a collective mind. Um, and whether or not you want to think that um, there's a collective inner mind as well, I mean that's up for debate. But like I like I said, um, I would want more um, logical proof of that. But Anyways, um, going on to, um, now that we've covered the background a bit, um, the, the inner mind, um, although it doesn't have the persistent order that nature has, um, it does have something that is what I call nature adjacent or the unnatural natural. Um, I also call this um, the, the spirit of the inner reality. And the reason why I use this particular word is because um, it serves a similar purpose to the nature like it, it has a there's a driving force there's a way that things behave which seem to be um, more semantic than they are structured um, symbolic and uh, semantic um, as opposed to being uh, governed by order and disorder and um, and, and this is important to to note uh, because there are particular limitations to nature um, one of the one of the laws uh, of nature is that everything must have a cause. Um, events have causes. Uh, but the problem with uh, the idea of causes is that if you take it to the limit, you find that you have to have an initial cause that is an uncaused cause or an unmoved mover. So you have to break that law in order to describe the origin of the universe. And, and it's a similar case with uh, energy conservation. Um, and energy is conserved um, until you try to get to the origins of the universe and try to figure out where everything came from and then all of a sudden now you have to break energy uh, conservation and, um, and and there's a lot of people who are in the scientific field now who are saying that maybe energy isn't conserved and um, and, and they provide all of these these abstract ideas as, as proof of it but the, when, when you th think about it, what they're actually doing is they're, they're breaking the laws of nature because they're trying to understand where the origins of the universe come from, and you can't explain it. Um, there's, a, uh, there's another uh, particular theory. Um, if you're familiar with, um, with, with particle physics just a little bit, you might be aware of the idea of like uh, matter and antimatter or particles and antiparticles. And uh, one of the problems of physics that they've been trying to figure out was why there's so much matter in our universe and not that much antimatter. And so there's this idea that at the time of the Big Bang, that uh, ev with everything being so hot and dense that the Higgs field breaks down, and that um, you end up with a completely different set of laws of physics that govern the universe where there's no gravity. And uh, within this pro uh, within this particular environment, um, there is a process called leptogenesis, um, which creates an asymmetry between um, the number of particles and antiparticles in the universe. So then as the universe cools down and the, um, the, the Higgs field takes over, the, um, you end up having more matter in the universe than antimatter. Um, but like I mentioned, like all of these, I mean, all of these laws, they all require you to um, break the limits of nature. You are creating exceptions to the rule. And, um, and then there's another um, class of ideas um, when talking about the origins of the universe, which I call gloriously dumb ideas. And uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. And I, I just want to be um, clear that when, I, when I'm talking about these things, I'm, I'm not being very specific. What I'm talking about is the general class of theories. Um, the, uh, the first type of uh, theory that I have a problem with is this idea of the Klein bottle. Um, and, or just a general class of theories of about the universe expanding into itself and that being the origin of the universe this is the biggest circular I mean this is just entirely circular logic here and it makes no sense whatsoever one because you can't bend space and time um, and, and if you if you want to hear more about that I would suggest looking at my first video um, I go into um, the an alternative theory to that which is based upon being um, and uh, a second idea is something called the vibrating string theory, where like the universe is um, somehow uh, constructed of multi-dimensional vibrating strings, and they've been working on this for many years, and they've not even gotten close. Um, it's a dead end. It's it's a dumb idea. Um, 
but anyway, the, the third idea is this idea of a hypersphere gloam. And, I, and this one's actually been uh, taking off... Um, well, it's a relatively recent idea, I think. And it's this idea that the uh, the three-dimensional space uh, that we observe is actually like a tangent to a four-dimensional hypersphere. And uh, the, the, the one thing that all of these ideas seem to have in common, and the reason why I call them gloriously dumb ideas, is that they try to present time as geometric, and time is not geometric. Um, you cannot make time geometric because time is motion. Time is persistent change. Um, if you make time geometric, now all you've done is you've created another variable that has to behave like as hypertime. So you've created another dimension that's entirely hypothetical between time and space. Um, and, and, it, and it's silly. Time time is not geometric. This, this is ridiculous. Um, so... Regardless of the way that you, you, no matter what, the which way you're approaching it, what you find is that you have to have exceptions to the rule or um, completely different laws or, uh, or patterns to describe the origins of the universe, something that is beyond nature. And uh, so what this means is that um, nature could not have come first. Something could, should have came before nature. And so this is where we start talking about the inner reality. Um, because the inner reality isn't governed by nature. Um, the inner reality is governed by the unnatural natural. Uh, it's governed by spirit, which is the idea of... Um, like I said, it's more semantic um, than it is uh, based on order and disorder. And so, the if you're asking yourself like what, what this is actually is, well, the first thing we can notice is that we do have, um, in a sense, sort of eyes and ears of the mind... Um, because when you're dreaming or when you're having a vision or a hallucination or whatever, um, we see forms and, and we see the being of these forms, but, um, we're not seeing them through our physical eyes and we're not seeing them through our ears. There are, um, senses in our heads, um, or in our minds, um, or specifically that, um, allow us to see these things that are independent of the physical body parts. And so, um... This has led me to um, thinking that if if death, um, the destruction of the natural body, is a return to the origin, um, a return to um, the spiritual um, self, that these particular thought forms, these these forms that exist within our minds, um, would persist after death. And uh, this may explain why a lot of people who have after death experiences. Um, why the experiences that they seem to have are very dreamlike. Um, and th there's another thing as well, which is that all religion, uh, no matter which one you look at, seems to um, seek spiritual development to become more godlike. And um, if you were to ask the question of what a god actually is, well, a, a god is just an entity that has a degree of mastery um, over the spiritual realm and is therefore um, immortal and all powerful. And uh, also, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an instance, uh, omniscient, because there's nothing that actually exists outside of its own consciousness. Um, but, uh, just pondering on this a, a, a bit, um, If you don't take the time to develop these particular skills in, in the real world because you see no use for them, or you, or you think that, um, you, you think that because these these things are in your mind that they're unreal. Um, after death, it's like it's like all you have is this muscle that you've never exercised, and so there's there's a collapse like to say because once the physical body ends i mean the mental body if there is one after death would be sure to follow and, and this kind of reminds me of this um particular um thing that was presented um and, and i've mentioned this before but i, I do look at a little bit of uh, occult stuff i like to keep an open mind but be critical of of what what i'm taking in um but there was this one particular idea that really struck me and it came from this guy who is an occultist um he has a YouTube series, but um, he was showing these old celestial maps of um, from way back in like the medieval ages or whatever, and um, 
And in the center of the, this map, they have the, the Earth, and then beyond that, they have the Moon, and then beyond that, they have Mars. And it just keeps going up between all these different planet um, planetary things until they get to the Sun, and then it goes beyond the Sun. And then they talk about the constellations, and it keeps going out. And one of the things that he mentioned is that, that this was not supposed to be a map of the solar system. This was supposed to be a map of the inner reality, and that the Earth was supposed to be a representation of the body. It's, it's the physical. And that... Um, all of these rings that are extending out beyond, beyond that are uh, like realms of consciousness that are um, they're supposed to be, it's supposed to be a map of the inner reality. And uh, he had said in his video that as um, that the belief of of a lot of the alchemists and stuff like that, and one of the reasons why they use so much sim symbolism is because the thing that they were trying to do is um, they were trying to complete the great work, which was this idea of you're trying to. Um, attain these these godlike properties um, by developing your your spiritual self in that if you don't complete the work within your own lifetime which is the only place that you can do it because you have persistence that after you die all of these rings start collapsing one by one so first would come the earth um, part of your of your uh, inner reality which is your physical or your physical body and then comes um, the next um, the next plane after that, which would be like the moon, uh, the lunar, um, then after that, like the Mars, and all of these rings keep collapsing until um, your consciousness is completely destroyed. And um, this is this is a very interesting thing to think about um, because it makes sense. Um, and. Uh, one of the things that I, I think is kind of a pity is that one of the most useful ways, I mean, one of the most, the best ways we have for developing particular type of skills is through the use of things like psychedelics. Um, and we've used these since the dawn of mankind. As, as a matter of fact, um, there's there was a theory, um, I, I think even in science, that um, mankind actually started through the use of psychedelics. Like there were, um, like these primitive ape-like creatures or whatever just um, snacked on the wrong shroom or something like that and then like to it led to these um, certain types of development um, within the mind that um, led to the evolution of the human race and uh, I mean if that's the case I mean, it's kind of sad that we live in a world today where the the things that are most useful for developing um, that that spiritual connection um, are outlawed, and uh, but anyway, these these are um, these are just my thoughts on the uh, the idea of an afterlife. Um, like like I said, I mean you can't explain the origin of the universe without breaking laws of nature, and uh, there there's a uh, another uh, thing as well I'd like to mention while we're still have the video open, which is um, there is a um, Well, I guess it's not that important, but it, it, it had to do with this idea of um, the the creation of the universe, because the idea that, uh, and I had mentioned this in one of my previous videos, we had two between the nature between nothing and infinity. Um, you can't multiply nothing, you can't divide nothing, um, and you can't subtract from nothing. Um, and so this idea that you can reproduce by creation um, with something that's external from yourself, like multiplication, um, the universe could not have come to existence through reproduction, and it could not have come to existence through um, through division, like dividing amongst itself. And so, the only way that anything could have come into existence from um, is if it was already there. Um, but the problem with this idea is that the only way that you can create um, something new from something that's already there is if you're talking about changing the connections between things rather than the components. Um, so, in this sense, the only method of creation that I can see as being feasibly possible is creation um, in, in a mental sense. Um, there's no other alternative possible. Um, anything other aside from that and you're talking about something that is completely random and uh, Einstein himself once said it's like God doesn't throw dice um, there's no randomness in the universe um, 
And also another thing I want to mention here as well. Um, when it comes to quantum physics, now a lot of people are familiar with Bell's theorem and they try and say that this is... Um, that this is proof that the universe must be random or whatever. And it's like, no, it's not. Actually, Bell's theorem is um, a, uh, a proof of the idea that non-local information must exist, which is kind of a duh if you understand what the nature of being is. Um, of course, information is non-local because the being of things is not constrained by their forms. Um, the being of things is infinite in space. Um, and so you you solve the same problem. Like you can under you can understand entanglement. You can understand all of these uh, different things. Why action can happen at a distance, um, in regards to like uh, gravity and electric theory and stuff. Because um, but anyway, um, I, I think I'm going to go ahead and cut this video off here. Um, if you have any uh, thoughts on this, or if it um, struck any any tones with you, just uh, leave a comment below, and um, thank you for watching.